Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everybody. Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are joining from. A very warm welcome to all of you. It's just about time to get started, but we are going to hold for just another moment or two to allow for a few more registrants to connect to the system. So thank you so much for being prompt, and we'll get started in just a minute or two. While we're waiting to get started, everyone, I would invite you to use the chat box function on the right side of your screen to introduce yourself. Uh, some of us are not able to see the list of attendees in this uh, webinar. So if you want to share your name, your organization, the country from which you come, please uh, feel very free to do that in the chat window on the right hand side of the screen. Thank you. All right, everyone, I think we'll get started as we have three fantastic presentations to get to and we want to make sure we have enough time for some question and answer discussion uh, in the second portion of this session. So welcome again to everyone, wherever you are calling in from. We're really glad that you could join us today. Thank you so much for the time and thank you especially to um, the SRJS partners who are on the line to share their specific experiences. And of course, thank you to the SRJS coordinating partners who invited us as IUCN Global Gender Office to join efforts in this initiative. Today, I'm really excited to share the agenda with you. We'll be hearing experiences from uh, Uganda and the Guyanas, Guyana and Suriname, the specific experience that's uh, experiences that these country partners have had integrating gender considerations in SRJS. Um, we're thinking of this webinar in terms of principles to action. We know that gender equality is a guiding principle of SRJS, so what does it look like in action? The second part of the webinar today is going to, uh, we're going to save time for Q&A with all of you, and we hope that you'll also uh, take the mic, so to speak, to share some experiences from your own work. Before I continue, just a couple of housekeeping matters to keep us organized. Uh, well, I should start by introducing myself. Sorry for that. My name is Kate Oren, and on behalf of my colleague Emmett Boyer, who's also on the line and who I'm sure many of you have had many emails with, uh, I'd like to welcome you to this webinar. So today, everyone who has joined in is going to be kept in mute mode, especially for the presentation portion of this webinar. This is simply to avoid background noise and connectivity disturbances, but we certainly hope you will not feel silenced on this webinar. You are very much welcomed and encouraged to interact in what you're hearing 
especially using the chat function. So if you look at the right hand side of your screen in your control panel, there are a bunch of little options uh, in the second part of that control panel. And if you use your the little chat box to share questions or comments, we'll be keeping a close eye on that window and compiling the questions to answer uh, and go through in the Q&A portion. You can also use the raise your hand function uh, to ask for the mic. And when we get to the Q&A and discussion section, Emmett can uh, unmute your microphone so that you can share your question or, or comment um, out loud. So thank you in advance for that. Uh, like I said, this webinar is one of, we're going to have two parts, the presentations first and then save time for the Q&A. And then this session itself is actually one of two parts. We have uh, organized two sessions of this gender-focused webinar. The first happened a couple of hours ago. This is the second session. And the purpose for this, of course, is to try to accommodate not just all the as many time zones as we possibly can but also to try to make space to hear from as many specific partners and country and context experiences that we can um, some of you will will know or have participated in the survey that we circulated earlier this year we wanted to get a sense from you from the srjs partners at this stage in the game what what are you interested in in terms of capacity building and experience sharing on gender considerations and this was one of the most uh, this ranked the highest was opportunity to share experiences and lessons and challenges with each other so that's really the purpose of this discussion today and we hope to do more of this as the year continues this gender focused webinar uh, session is also organized as part of a thematic series with other IUCN offices. So some of you may have been involved in webinars focused on environmental law or on business and biodiversity, and those uh, subsequent sessions will be coming up. We'll put up a schedule uh, at the end of this webinar. Very briefly, just as a, a, a quick additional note of self-introduction. I know that many of us have been in touch by email. Some of us have even had Skype sessions to work on work plans and go through your gender analyses many moons ago. So it's really a pleasure to continue to be in touch with all of you. Uh, I, I think that probably you all know IUCN, International Union for Conservation, Na uh, Conservation of Nature, is an intergovernmental organization comprised of many hundreds of governmental as well as non-governmental members around the world. And as part of the Global Program on Governance and Rights, IUCN's gender team is a, a very diverse team working across the environmental and sustainable development fields or sectors, subsectors, if you will. Specifically with respect to SRJS, since 2016, we have been very happy to support country partners with specific technical support, capacity building activities, and responding to other specific requests, including uh, making knowledge products available and trying to find uh, relevant literature to support specific project activities. Um, and we will be engaged in that capacity for the next couple of years as well. And why do we do this? Of course, just setting the scene for, for just a moment, SRJS program goals include water and food security and climate resilience. And we know SRJS as an initiative, know, as an initiative knows that gender inequality is a major barrier to meeting those goals. On the other hand, gender responsive action can instead unlock results together with realizing a rights-based framework. SRJS is committed to gender equality and inclusivity as guiding principles. And this means that all actions in some way, and they are different, need to recognize gender issues, need to ensure that they don't exacerbate gender gaps, discrimination, and bias, and that SRJS implementation is a vehicle for advancing women's empowerment and gender equality, and indeed the realization of a rights-based framework. SRJS promotes gender responsive action. What does this mean? This means identifying and understanding gender gaps and then taking meaningful steps to try to improve them. First, to ensure we do no harm 
and then to make every effort to do better. On the screen, we have a couple of examples of what we mean by gender gaps, the big gaps in terms of equality. I've put just one tag here just for the sake of time in orange font that we'll, we'll talk about as a quick example. Even though this number has ticked up slowly but surely over re recent years, still only 23% of parliamentarians around the world are women. And yet, we know that experience and data clearly shows across levels, across sectors, across regions, that advancing gender equality and women's empowerment unlock potential. For example, we know data has shown that countries with more women in parliament are more likely to ratify environmental treaties. So if we look at SRJS broadly, we're looking at these kinds of gaps, but also strategic, smart, context-specific, uh, very culturally specific ways to unlock this potential, to accelerate goals, and to realize women's and men's human rights. And we're seeing that it's very much happening, which is, again, the purpose of this webinar. What do gender principles look like in action? We know that SRJS across different countries and initiatives are doing incredibly interesting and diverse work on gender. We see that the roles, responsibilities, the knowledge and priorities of both women and men are informing action, informing sustainable solutions and innovative solutions. We see women and men being valued and integrated as agents of change. And we see coalitions that are driving change, especially with respect to lobby and advocacy, including women and women's organizations as partners, allies, beneficiaries, stakeholders, but even more than stakeholders. So we are so fortunate to have a series of presentations today from across different country and, uh, and context-specific um, uh, contexts to, um, to share with us their experiences so far. So first, I am delighted to give the floor to Rajab Wenge, who is a project coordinator from Uganda at the National Association of Professional Environmentalists, NAPE. NAPE is doing extraordinary work on SRJS and, and many other projects in the country. Um, Rajab specializes in development of advocacy strategies and in project planning and management, and he has vast experience working with communities affected by mineral and natural resource extraction, which he's been working on for about the last 10 years. So Rajab, the floor is yours, and thank you so much. Great to see you online. My name is Abwengi Rajab Yusuf, as they have told you, I work with NAPE, and I coordinate the Shared Resources Joint Solutions Program in Uganda. Are you hearing me properly? Yes, very well, thank you. Okay. And here in Uganda, I'm coordinating the SRJS program. The SRJS program in Uganda is a country a country program focusing on on conservation of IPGs and basically we are strengthening the capacity of civil society groups, communities and other players to promote the conservation of international public goods and as Kate said this is food security, water supply, climate resilience, and biodiversity. And here in Uganda, the major focus is majorly the Albertine grabbing, and this is the western gate of the country. And we are taking the landscape approach, and at the moment we are, we are operating in two landscapes. That is the Matson landscape, that one is the north of the Nile and then the Queen Elizabeth landscape that lies in the extreme south uh, near the Virunga National Park at uh, the Lake Edward George Basin. So basically all that one is the oil belt in Uganda and in, in terms of importance 
this happens to be the most biodiversity rich region of the country. If you want to locate the major ecosystems in Uganda, that's where you have the mushroom, that's where you have Maxon Falls National Park, that's where you have uh, the Kabuya Wildlife Reserve, that's where you have Bugung Wildlife Reserve, that's where you have Queen Elizabeth National Park, that's the, the pathway of the Nile into Lake Albert, then still that is the landscape where you find the Nile gets its water before it goes upwards into Sudan, Egypt, and the Med Sea, and then southwards, that is the the landscape where we have Queen Elizabeth National Park, and as you know, Madison and Queen Elizabeth are the biggest two uh, national parks in the country. And, and in terms of rivers, lakes, this happens to be the most rich part of, of, of the East African region, and basically, the, the western arm of the Rift Valley is, 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 is passes into this belt and normally ends in the zigzag style around Lake Albert. So basically, in Uganda, we are running this program with other partners, uh, NAPE, or National Association of Professional Environmentalists, is one of the partners. Uh, and then the next partner we work with is called the African Institute for Energy Governance, or AFIEGO. And then the next partner we work with is called EcoTrust, Ecological Trust of Uganda, EcoTrust. And then we have the IUCN Uganda Country Office, uh, IUCN Uganda Country Office, praying the M monitoring, evaluation, and learning role, and also some element of coordinating that docket of monitoring in the entire program. So basically, that's how we stand. And the, my presentation, maybe in the interest of time, I will run through the strategies for mainstreaming gender uh, that we have uh, seen or could work arising from even the training that we held last year in 2017 in March, supported by the IUCN Global Gender Office, which we appreciate very much because before I think we had never had a training of the kind where we have uh, experiences from different parts of the globe on how mainstreaming gender could be done. And then I will also talk about the prevailing or the existing challenges and then exactly in the, in the SRGS program, what are we doing on the ground? And then maybe I will entertain some more questions or some clarifications, and then we see how to proceed. So basically on the strategies, uh, gender seems still up to date to be something that most people don't understand. And here, both the educated and the not educated don't seem to understand the subject of gender properly. Some understand it as role, some look at it as number, some look at it as women, others as, as both men and women. But basically, we know that gender is about roles and the responsibilities that, he, that he, the marginalized sections of the communities play. And when we talk about the marginalized sections, in most cases, the women come out strongly to be the most marginalized section of the community, both in the politics, in economic empowerment, in social life, and other things. So, if you want to mainstream gender, there are a, a series of methodologies or strategies you require. For example, conducting the gender seminars. These ones bring in an element of skill. The application of the whole household approach, in most cases, you find that if you want to approach a problem or you want to build capacity or you want to, to, to introduce an idea, but 
once you are doing that and you don't consider that you don't consider the household approach where you bring in both the men the, the, the man the woman the children in your home then you might not really achieve much because if you bring segregation from the beginning then it, it means that right away from the word go you are bringing in a power problem tools for climate change vulnerability to understand the gender needs in different groups in most cases Climate change will affect communities differently, but when it comes to the vulnerability, you will find that in most cases, the women, the children are affected most. So once you are coining these tools, you need to be very, very smart in the way you coin them so that the section, the, the most vulnerable sections of the community uh, come out strongly. Otherwise, you run the risk of missing the point right away from the word go. The training manuals, in most cases, most of the training manuals you find they are really not gender balanced. And that means that if the manual itself has a problem, then the message you are going to, to, to spread from the manual you have developed already will be biased or inclined towards either men or women alone and eventually find that it is not working out very well. Working with the government to integrate gender in the forest sector programs and climate change mitigation, then supporting development of the gender roadmap to ensure equal benefits to the community. For example, in the forestry part, as regards to gender, there are, is, there are situations where you find that that uh, there are benefits, for example, or there are roles that can be, that can come up. If, for example, there are there are there are roles and there are benefits that can accrue. For example, we know if it is the forest, for example, development on forest the forest the ecosystems. 2% of the benefit sharing goes back to the communities. But the question is, how much of this 2% is going into issues that address, for example, challenges of women? If it is, for example, a development project taking place near forested ecosystem, we know 5% normally is given to the communities uh, to be the ones to take up that that percentage of development. For example, if it is the sugar planting, the outgrowers within the communities take some element of producing for uh, producing or uh, having a share of what they have to produce to feed the factory in place. But the question becomes, when you are determining the 5% that goes to the communities as uh, how how much of this goes into issues of women then of course gender indicators spell out how many women benefit from initiatives they provide communities in most cases most people mess up on the gender indicators once the indicators have a problem you find you cannot go too far then economic empowerment of women most cases women when it comes to climate change disasters, when it comes to income generation, you find the women in most cases are in homes. They are in homes taking care of children. And so at the end of the day, they are the men that have the resources, the money to do work. And normally, once they are economically empowered, the men, then you find even in terms of decision making, then they outnumber women. So it is important that we work on the economic empowerment of the woman because once she's economically empowered, then she has the power to take decisions in a home and beyond. Creating gender champions. Most quite often in the communities, we need to develop, I normally call them this, and that we call them frontline front uh, champions. Here we call them sustainability educators, uh, women sustainability educators. And we need to have these empowered 
agents in the communities to be able to provide the, the confidence to provide the the, the, the required learning, the, the knowledge sharing, uh, the advice to other women who think they might not manage some certain things. Fair resource allocation, gender budgeting. In most cases you find there are resources that need to be invested in a community, but when you look at the consideration in terms of gender, you find that there is purely unfair resource allocation. The needs of women are not given consideration, and perhaps they think these, uh, these uh, the women maybe are in their homes taking care of children, and perhaps they don't need some of these resources, and at the end of the day, you find that the allocation is inclined more to men than women and other, uh, 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 other sections of the community, and at the end of the day, you find that they are disadvantaged in terms of decision making. So we need to emphasize the issue of budgeting and go ahead and do follow-ups. Then ownership, as you know very well that, yes, women in most cases and in most countries across the globe, they access, but when it comes to ownership, it is a challenge. Once you don't work on the issue of resource ownership, even if you address the issue of access, you are not really doing much. Because at the end of the day, for example, I can have like 100 acre of land, and I say, yes, my, my the women can access it, but if they cannot take a decision on how they should use it, then you find you are not doing much. Feminization of poverty. Women are presumed to be more poorest members of the community, and therefore, and therefore, more vulnerable. And now these are majorly the challenges. In most cases, most, most people, especially men and leaders, especially maybe on the African continent and maybe other, other sections or other parts of the world that are still not developed, they think women are the poorest and therefore or they should remain like that. You find they think it is normal for a lady to be in the family or to be a, a somebody on the receiving side and they don't want them to take that empowerment or economic empowerment role of deciding by themselves. Then dominant patriarch commands cultural and religious beliefs make women remain as, subordin as subordinate of men, and you have seen this one even in the offices, perhaps some, some organizations or some religions or some cultures, they think there are roles that women should not take, and that's why when you even go in most parts across, across the globe, you will find that those big positions such as uh, the, the, the president, the vice president, the speaker of parliament, most are dominated by men because there is a thinking that perhaps not, those are not the right position that women should be taking. And when it comes to the African continent, it is worse because there are cultural beliefs that even think women should not eat certain foods, which is unfortunate. Then social cultural attitudes, of course, absence of gender mainstreaming strategy. You might have the interest, but once the strategy is not there, then you might really struggle to achieve gender equality and equity. Then limited space platforms for women in decision making, in most cases, these are limited to men because they think women should remain in homes taking care of children. Yet when it comes to disasters or to risks they face the most, and that one is a challenge, Mas manifestation of climate change effects resulting from numerous and sustainable development processes in the areas of work that has created food insecurity, women and youth exclusion in decision-making processes, 
and social and environmental injustice. And then another challenge is women have no control over land. They own, as I said before, they only have the user rights. And we are saying that in most cases, even if you access something where you cannot independently take a decision about its control, then really you might not, you might struggle to get what you want. If it is my land and you can go plant crops or put their rice gardens, but at the end of the day, you cannot determine when I should sell it, how much I should sell it, why I should sell it, then you realize you still have a challenge even if you have access rights. Then, of course, the last one was the theory about gender. Gender, most people don't understand it. Theory in gender mainstreaming. Most look at gender in terms of numbers and they don't really understand in practice how it should be domesticated or implemented. And that one continues lingering in the minds of people and eventually find it is a challenge to practically uh, uh, implement gender in organizations, in communities, in countries, in policy review, in policy formulation, and the like. And then maybe I can go ahead and go to the actions that we have applied here to try to address all mainstream gender especially in the SRJS program as NAPE, and majorly we have compiled gender concerns and submitted them to the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development and the uh, IUC, IUC in Uganda country office has some uh, good leverage when it comes to uh, penetrating the Ministry of Gender, Labor and Social Development and there that has been a platform that we think or a stepping stone that we think we can still continue using to be able to raise issues of gender in this program. Then we have of course still through the support of the IUCN Uganda country office also developed the gender indicators and for the M and E framework and this one has gone across the board the entire SRHS partners that is NAPE, AFIEGO, and ECOTRUST, and the imprint of the ECO of IUC in Uganda country office, I think has a, a, some good lessons that we normally share on this. The framework is there, uh, we meet and we do some review of it, and then even when we are harvesting, outcomes every year, we ensure that he, this issue of there are indicators tailored to gender that we harvest as partners. And then input to the proposed environmental bill. And here the SRJ is partners. Again, I'm saying here we are talking about NAPE, Atiego, the Eco Trust, and I use in Uganda country office came together, met, and then reviewed the bill, identified the gender concerns, and then organized the meeting with the Natural Resource Committee of Parliament, presented the concerns, and we think in the final row, once the row is complete, some or all of these concerns could be incorporated into this role because the national environmental role or B is the mother of all environmental roles in the country. Then we have also shared the local content policy with partners in the landscape where we operate and others at national level. And here in this policy, we try to show that even when these oil companies or other players are doing business, there are some sections of their, uh, their operations that they can leave to the locals to, to play a role and in this emphasize uh, the women. 
uh, because women are, uh, in most cases are affected most when it comes to these development projects. And then in 2018, we still have the gender plans. We think we can continue pushing ahead. And one of the mother, one of them is building and strengthening a grassroots women's movement to collectively tackle gender injustices. And in this movement already, we have tried to to form it. it, there is already some publications organized or mobilized around, the, around 1,500 women with support of other partners, uh, of course one of the SRJS funders and then others uh, like women, women Africa, in the Gaia Foundation, then uh, Mama Cash, and then um, Agent Action Fund, and then Womankind UK, all these are, are focused on helping uh, or sharing information on how we can build a strong grassroots women-led movement to collectively tackle issues of climate justice, issues of dangers of extractive, issues of land grabbing, where we think women are affected most. And here we shall be conducting women energy assemblies. In 2017, we, we did one, and in 2018, we shall organize another one. Then the feminist participatory action research, that one we have already conducted it, and it is in the final stages of completion. And then we are also through this movement supporting women-led demonstration pilots for on food sovereignty and energy alternatives. And as we talked about the, the methodologies or the strategies, economic empowerment of a woman is very important if you want to, to raise a, or to strengthen the issue of gender equity and equality, and here these demonstration pilots are led by women and also coordinated by women-led groups in areas where we operate. We call them sustainability villages. Uh, that's the model name we have called them. And here, women demonstrate what they know, the knowledge, the vast knowledge base they have on food sovereignty and energy alternatives. And these demonstration pilots are used as trigger centers for replication in other community villages, especially those that are, have been affected by the oil extractive oil industry in Uganda. Then also artistic, using artistic impressions and here we women form uh, groups uh, like and the organize or form poems, drama plays and tours and then these ones are showcased on national events like National Women's Day celebrations, uh, National Environmental Day celebrations, uh, the Independence Day celebration where women showcase some of these dangers in, and challenges in the areas of land grabbing, uh, rights abuse, food rights abuse that they face. And maybe lastly, uh, which I think is not on this presentation, is the community green radio, the community green radio talk shows. Nape, has a community green radio platform. And this platform was basically uh, coined down or established by NAPE to amplify the voices of marginalized women groups in the oil region. Because we realized that most of the commercial radio stations do not consider the communities 
issues as important. They are majorly interested in businesses, companies that have products to advertise, products to sell, uh, politicians that have speeches to make, but not on the real issues of communities. And so this radio is already established by NAPE. It is purely a community green radio. It has community listeners clubs most of them were led by women local leaders where we operate and how we get news we have community news collectors and now the job that NAPE does is always bring go record the voices of women or bring them uh, to the radio talk shows to talk the challenges they face which we think at the moment apart from having a challenge of a budget to make sure that it becomes very vibrant, we think it is a very good idea that will help us amplify more the voices of women and bring in the gender lens in the work we do. Our target is to, our target is to have 5,000 women. So that's where my presentation ends. Rajab, thank you so much. I, I kept wanting to jump in and try to try to um, move us to the next presentation, and yet you presented so many interesting and vitally important points. I, I struggled to jump in and interrupt you at any point. Thank you so much for that presentation. You raised so many interesting issues. I know we're going to run out of time and not be able to come back to to. Um, to come to so many of the things that you raised, gender responsive budgeting, the importance of that, uh, the, 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 the opportunity that the building of interest creates and yet the gap when there's no strategy or action plan in place and, and how partners can, can really act and so many of the specific activities that you've highlighted are, are so wonderful. So we're gonna be coming back to you for more information to share across the SRJS partners. We are going to have to ask you to talk quickly because we're running out of time, Priya and Sharda, and yet we know there is so much for you to share. So without further ado, I'm going to actually just skip your introductions. Um, I'll, I'll do them super fast. Priya Ramperso is a senior coordinator for SRJS at WW. F. Guyanas. She's been working as a, uh, the SRJS senior coordinator, and she works very closely with Sharda Ganga, who is the director at Proyecta in Suriname. Um, as a rights-based organization, Proyecta works focuses on the interlinkage between human rights, democracy, and governance with a special focus on gender equality and women's, uh, women's rights. So Priya and Sharda, without further ado, I'm going to give you the floor. Thank you so much. Okay. Hi. Just Hello, Priya. Just that you're seeing my screen. Yes, it looks great, and we hear you clearly. Okay. Um, perfect. Uh, thank you so much, Kate and and Emmett, and and thank you for um, giving us the opportunity to be able to make this presentation. And um, you can just put it. Sorry, Priya. You can just change it to um, slideshow mode if you like. Uh, or I did. It's, yeah, okay, don't worry about it. So you're not, see, you're not seeing the full screen? We can see your, like, the notes screen. Uh-huh. Oh, so I think I know what happened. Slideshow mode, then we'll, we'll have a fuller screen. But really, it, it doesn't matter too much. You can just go ahead. Uh-oh, now we've lost audio. Hmm. Hello? Ah, there you are. Okay. Um, um, do you see the full screen now? It still, it still shows the, the presentation mode, so we can see the, the slides. That might, that might be fine, just the way it is. Don't, don't worry too much. Uh, I am... Um... Yeah, no, it's all right. It's all right. Sometimes these systems do funny things to our system. So <laughs> go, okay. just go ahead. Uh, sorry about that. No, yeah. no, it's fine, please. Um, so I will quickly uh, go through this presentation. Um, and, and 
aim to reflect our efforts in the Guyana's eco region. And so I'd like to start by providing uh, some brief context on the Guyanas and then introduce our overall approach. And as you introduced um, earlier that in the Guyanas, uh, this pr the presentation will be done by both myself and my colleague, Sharna Ganga, who will present the specific interventions of Suriname and I'll present on specific interventions in, um, in Guyana. So quickly, um, in terms of context, the, 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 uh, on the Guyanas, before I go into the details, so the Guyana Shield is one of the SRJS focused eco regions, and um, and it's uh, it's also uh, it's a larger area as you can see in the in the map, um, but implementation is being done in Guyana and Suriname. Um, we are collaborating with IUCN and WWF through an alliance to implement the program, and we've done a number of context studies um, within within uh, the program itself to set the baseline. Um, in terms of uh, our work, uh, gender is a cross-cutting component for us, and it is embedded in the environmental governance program. It's um, it's, it's aimed really to increase the operational space of CSOs for lobby and advocacy through wider participation in environment and natural resource governance and decision making processes. And um, also we look at applying gender responsive interventions to, to not only um, empower and include um, vulnerable and marginalized groups, but also to have a broader focus on, on gender within, um, within our work. Um, we do have, because of, of the circumstances in, our, in both countries are very different, we also do have very specific gender applications, recognizing that both Guyana and Suriname are at different stages in the process and the way we focus on gender. Um, for us in Guyana, we, we have uh, applied a gender lens on the environment and the natural resource sector, and also through a rights-based approach. Um, we, we have been working sort of a dual, um, uh, we have been taking a dual approach. One is um, direct interaction and engagement with our SRGS partners, so those partners that we have been engaged in a program um, since the program started. And we have also been working at the national level to influence and to engage and to increase the attention of gender issues in this sector. Um, we have had uh, what we call a uh, gender framing discussion as, as uh, one of the many first steps in this process. Um, this gender framing discussion was held in November last year, and and it was the first time that we've had multiple stakeholder groups in the natural resource sector come together to discuss gender. Um, in the past, the gender conversations have been focused on social dimensions mainly, but um, we have now started to explore the nuances of gender in the context of environment and natural resources. And this gender framing workshop really aimed to bring together um, direct and indirect partners engaged in the SRGS program um, to engender sort of collective understanding on gender and inclusiveness, um, to understand the concepts of gender and inclusiveness, to develop a collective understanding, and to de sorry, to develop uh, an action agenda to guide partners in their gender work. Um, the participants in this discussions were varied. So we had representation from government, from academia, from NGOs, and community-based organizations, livelihoods, and, um, and enterprise. And I, I have this quote here by one of our uh, facilitators who, um, who would have given us who would have given us the, the, um, some guidance in the process. And I, I ref, I'm re place it here to reflect 
based on it that we can be talking about gender mainstreaming, but sometimes we don't change, we don't change our perspective. So unless we're willing to make that change happen, it wouldn't, it, nothing will happen actually. Um, they, they, this, com this conversation or this discussion created what we call a safe space um, to have this open discussion on gender and um, to understand the perceptions of gender as well. For many participants, the concepts were new. So that means for us, we have to take a step back and really start from the very basic in our gender interventions. Um, while one of the main outputs from the discussion was the framing of an action agenda. The action agenda looked at how we increase awareness on gender and inclusiveness at all levels. Um, what are some of the capacity building needs for partners to apply gender elements in their work? And um, some of the tools that we will have to develop to engage other groups in communities and the approach for gender mainstreaming um, while we have developed that, we we're doing this in parallel with also helping many of the par partners who have not worked on gender issues or worked in gender in this particular context before um, to bridge that gap of um, uh, lack of awareness and understanding and how what it means to them. At, um, at at uh, fo sorry, following the the discussion, we've um, also commenced a number of gender audits with our partners, and those results. Um, the process is completed, the the, the survey, and we are currently processing those results. Um, additionally, we've engaged with the university, that's the University of Guyana, to undertake a um, gender equality study in science. What, what this really means is um, looking at the proportion of female students that are enrolled in science-based um, uh, uh, programs and how much have completed that intent, that program of study and how many have um, advanced to, um, to work in the same field uh, post studies. While there may be factors like job availability that could impact someone deviating from that field. We found that there are many barriers, especially for women who um, might have studied a particular science-based field and have um, deviated to another field um, of study because of the, the, the perceptions, the gender-based perceptions that are associated or, or that are intrinsically in, in that particular field of study. For, so for example, someone is a biologist then it requires them to be in the field a lot. And in being in the field, it means that they have to be in very um, remote conditions. And uh, for, for, for many families um, that impacts uh, the extent that the woman are, would be involved in that particular um, uh, career later in life. So um, this is one area that we're working to, um, to elaborate on very preliminary. The data is there um, and it's just a matter of bringing the elements together. Um, another aspect is integrating the gender component in a selected science based course. This discussion is still ongoing with us at the university. Um, to start with uh, probably just guest lectures for now, examining um, maybe uh, women in climate change and other thematic areas. Um, and outside of this, we're also planning public conversations on gender and inclusiveness in the context of environment and natural resources to start that larger conversation. At the national level, we have been um, contributing to the national gender policy uh, to influence really the focus on, on gender in the context of environmental natural resources. Um, the older versions of the gender policy um, only focused on or, or was very limited from the social dimensions or looking at um, 
uh, gender equality, but not taking into consideration some of the um, the, the the level of uh, or, or trying to understand and bringing in the 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 much needed um, gender elements as it relates to the particular sector of natural resources. So the draft policy is expected to be available for review by the end of the year. Um, we've also been a member uh, um, to a gender community of practice. Um, we've been collaborating with other NGOs in a community of practice on gender integration. The community of practice is looking at supporting gender integration or mainstreaming in the natural resource sector and to coordinate our gender work nationally. Um, and uh, as part of that, also we're co-hosting um, a gender and environment forum later in the year where we're intending to um, serve as a, uh, to serve as the launching platform for the public conversation um, I alluded to earlier. And in wrapping up, I would just quickly like to make a very uh, quick points. Um, in terms of what has been working for us so far. Um, it's the first time that we've been having conversations of gender elements in this field um, and using the gender lens to focus attention on um, policies and plans and interventions in environmental natural resources from a rights-based perspective. It therefore means that um, in, in we, we still have a long way to go, especially to um, ensure that decision makers are able to um, really understand what gender means. We've still, we still do have to deal with the many different interpretations of gender, um, and especially from a decision making level, but I think this is a good starting point. We've also been zeroing in on increasing the level of participation in the governance and decision making processes and and for that and in in that way um we're thinking beyond um gender equality and in the sense of where that just is um you know meaning having more female representation at the table um to look at how planned activities especially community type engagements um might limit those who are vulnerable in, in the community. Um, and there is national interest, even though, even though it's limited, um, and there is a level of openness to expand the scope and the discussions beyond just the government developing and addressing issues on gender. And it allows civil society to participate in the process and to frame uh, and being involved in framing the revision of the national gender policy. Um, some of our observations so far um, are along the lines of um, we 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 have been collecting sex disaggregated data um, as as a measure of representation, but we think that this is not enough. Um, because it's, it, it actually is a good representation, but it limits um, reflecting on or indicating how the level of participation would be increased. Um, so we're still struggling with some of those indicators and we are yet to fully develop our indicators, but um, these are some things that we're thinking through. Um, it, there's also a risk in the process of excluding men because um, from our interactions so far and from discussions we've had, there is an inherent, um, there's an inherent perception that when we say gender, we mean women. And in that way, um, uh, men are, are either excluded or not, um, not they, they don't feel that they need to participate in the process um there there is also um an observation we've had during our conversation so far where um gender and inclusiveness um there's a there's there's some gray areas it's blurred when we talk about gender and inclusiveness and then there are issues of cultural and traditional behavior and practices especially at the community scale. 
and um, we're still struggling with um, this, this kind of nuance and how to deal with it. Um, also, men and women, we found, have uh, this different relationship and interactions with in the natural resources. Um, many, are, um, because of the, our, our society and traditions, um, security is usually a bigger factor in, in this that displaces women or this allow women to equally participate or even to take a career as a mining engineer, for example. And this influence or bias and, and it creates this uh, belief of men having um, ownership of the resource. And that is a conversation that is a very tricky one, but it, we've started it. Um, uh, and and I, I think because of that inherent nature too, it, it links back to when we talk about gender, there is the first reaction that is something related to women. Um, and also from a resource perspective, we find that um, human and financial resources also impacts gender integration and advancing gender interventions. Um, and, and we do recognize the lack of uh, especially uh, human capacity within country to be able to advance these efforts. And that's from my end. Thank you. Priya, thank you so much. I, I realize we're, um, we've learned an important lesson here that we need more time for these discussions. Uh, we're actually over. So I hope that people can still stay on for some, some minutes and we can turn the floor quickly to Sharda. Sharda, it's absolutely uh, horrible that we have <laughs> so few minutes for the women's organization represented amongst us. I'm going to stay on as long as you would like to talk. So the floor is yours. Hi, everybody. Um, I'll try and be quick, but I think everybody thinks that. Um, but I have <laughs> actually, uh, what you hear is my alarm ticking off. Um, so I'll, I'll, Priya talked a bit about uh, the Guyana's program. And I'll be focusing on uh, the work that we've been doing in Suriname. Um, and just to give you an, uh, an idea, uh, I think it's important that you know that uh, where we are above Brazil, and there's a huge ethnic diversity, which of course um, has an impact on the way you uh, approach uh, gender in programs. Uh, also important is the division between the coastal and the hinterland. Uh, and most of the programs uh, within SRJS um, are taking place within the rainforest. Uh, Suriname is an economy, has an economy based on ex extractive industries, uh, bauxite and gold. Um, we have several partners working in Suriname, in the SRJS uh, program in Suriname, but I think the most important thing that we need to take into consideration is that we've had a really late start of implementation of the program and that we actually just started working, really working in the last half of 2017. Um, so we're not at the stage yet where we can say, yes, we can harvest outcomes or whatever. So um, our approach to uh, gender within SRJS has to do with uh, capacity building. Um, and we see uh, the SRGS as an opportunity for partners, the partner organizations, to become gender responsive organizations. So we're not just looking at um, gender within the program and, uh, uh, and beyond, but uh, what do we leave behind when uh, the program ends? How strong are the partners then uh, in their capacity for uh, integrating a gender perspective in their programming? Uh, but also um, uh, SRJS as a way for organizational change and a change in the way of working. So uh, there are four stages uh, of, our, of our work. Uh, the first one started before the actual implementation uh, with capacity assessments of partners. We've done two capacity assessments. One was a more broader uh, assessment, the second one after we uh, really started working, where we focused on um, 
the way people, uh, organizations actually worked with communities um, and how they approach gender and inclusiveness in their day-to-day uh, -day, uh, working methods uh, in communities. The second, um, the second thing that we're doing is how uh, that we're looking at is uh, how do we make. Oh, I'm trying. How do we make? Oh, I'm struggling here. Unduck. Well, okay, I've unducked. Um, is uh, the gender responsiveness uh, the gender responsiveness of the SRJS program itself and its activities? Uh, we've developed gender indicators. Um, for most of the program um, in its initial stages. And we've uh, made recommendations for capacity building. The third stage we're in now um, has to do with capacity building for gender responsive programming of partners and uh, at the same time advocacy for gender responsive policies. So um, if we look at the capacity assessment I'm, I'm trying to okay capacity assessment for gender and inclusiveness we see that most organizations working within srjs of course uh, see gender as the number of women present second thing that was of importance is that gender is not an issue for partners um, some quotes if the communities don't see gender equality and participation and rights of women as a problem, should we? And the second thing is, do we even have the right to want to change traditional cultures? In this case, gender roles. Uh, in general, a general, uh, uh, a, a general comment is that up till now, partners, the, uh, the environmental and conservation organizations, don't usually start from a social perspective or a rights-based approach. Uh, they have their uh, conservation goals and um, working with people, so to speak, um, is a way to get to those goals. If we look at the process and activities, so we first started um, our idea or, or the strategy is we first started with uh, creating awareness in partners uh, just the basic discussions on what is gender and creating an awareness for the need for gender responsive programming and how that is linked to rights inclusiveness but also to the quality of their outcomes so that was the first stage the second stage is where we are at now is how do we build capacity we've done that through uh or we're doing that through uh, training, and, and I'll go into that a bit uh, in, in a while. Uh, building capacity for gender analysis uh, and data collection in the field, for gender responsive programming, developing tools for gender responsiveness in the in field work, and uh, organizational gender action plans. And the third um, strategy is advocacy for gender responsive policies and programs through thematic sessions, um, what Priya calls conversations, uh, on a national level where not just the partners, but also government and other entities on, uh, for example, gender and climate change, gender and natural, uh, natural resource management, et cetera. A uh, second thing is policy analysis and policy monitoring for selected issues where we will focus on uh, gender equality within that policy and training for uh, for change agents. Um, how we work is that uh, every time we start for each of these components, we start with a short one or half a day introductory session, um, which is very participatory um, and very hands-on because we also always have to keep in mind the lack of human resources, so time, you could call it time poverty. Everybody needs more time. So we have to minimize, uh, minimize the number of hours that we take away from them or take them away from their work. So we tried to do short introductory sessions, give a partner's homework, and then guide them uh, individually throughout 
uh, throughout their learning process through emails, phones, phone calls, visits, personal visits to their office, personal sessions uh, in, the, uh, in their offices, uh, so that organizations can set their own pace and goals. For example, uh, uh, when we come to the organizational gender action plans. Um, what we have seen, uh, the, the, most, the most important question that we raised at the very beginning, which was an eye opener for the partners was uh, the question, who benefits from your intervention? And uh, to our astonishment, that, that, was a, that was a question nobody really, really took, at, took to heart from the very beginning. So um, if you ask the question, who benefits from your intervention, uh, you start to look at your interventions, your activities from a different perspective, which is what we wanted them, uh, wanted the partners to realize. Um, what we've also seen is how quickly you can create understanding uh, in organizations uh, who have never before looked at their work through a rights-based or a gender perspective, how quickly that understanding can, uh, can come. Um, so they have a real, they've developed a real quick understanding that looking with a gender lens impacts the design of their programs, which is of course where you want to have people. Um, some quotes, um, one organization said, we would have had, we would have made other choices in our activities and approach. Someone else said, we see much more clearly the impact of our interventions. We may have done things which have unintended, which have had unintended consequences, and we may have contributed to making life more difficult for women. And the conclusion that someone uh, uh, made was that, oh, we see now that gender responsive programming just results in get better results. Keep in mind that English is not our first language. We speak Dutch. So, um, and I'll, uh, I'll end with this. Um, I think basically the question that we wanted to pose is how do we deal with this question with this um, conundrum that Priya also posted, uh, that Priya also talked about, is um, the balancing act between protecting indigenous culture and promoting a gender equality. Are these two things incompatible? What rights take precedence? So that's my, uh, that was my very quick view. Charda, that's that's a phenomenal presentation. Thank you that so was much. Exactly. That was remarkable. And you know what? We didn't lose a single participant. So I think that is a testament to you, Priya and Sharda, how interesting and relevant and useful those presentations are. Um, I think I can. I think everyone is seeing my screen now. I'm not quite sure. I hope we don't get kicked out of this system in the last second. Um, I sincerely want to thank you. I know that you very much need to hop off and get to another meeting, Sharda, in particular. I'm, I'm really grateful for you sticking around over time. Um, we clearly need to build more time in for these discussions and exchanges of information across these different projects. And as, as the gender team in our, in our role in this SRJS, we will look at how we can uh, do this more regularly and for longer periods of time and featuring other stories um, throughout this year in particular. Because we are just completely out of time, we are going to follow up with various questions that were submitted in advance by email and Skype and explore with the SRJS partners the possibility to move some of these, uh, this, the, next, the need for this next round of dialogue online, whether it's with the Green Collaborate platform or using our own website. Uh, we do have a gender and SRJS page on our website, which we're actually overhauling at the moment. It'll be much more beautiful and more interesting next month. Uh, so we look forward to that. 
I think especially in, in these three presentations, you've outlined so many specific activities, so many culturally and country specific ways that we can, quote unquote, turn principles into action. Priya, you mentioned something about, uh, you know, the challenge of, of gender issues being so theoretical, that gender mainstreaming is, is a theory. And yet, in these presentations, I've, I think we've, we've seen so many very specific ways that it is about action. There's no one right way to do gender, quote unquote. Taking a gender perspective is about shining a, a new light on different issues. Um, we often say in, in the gender team, you know, when we're working with environmentalists and, 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 and those working on natural resource governance issues, you know, we know that healthy ecosystems are comprised of diverse biodiversity. That is the point, biodiversity. So why would we take any other approach when we look at human beings? Gender equality, equality is about celebrating diversity and, and a gender lens lets us look at all of these different um, gaps, but also opportunities. Um, I want to thank everyone again so much. We have run out of time. Again, we're gonna move this discussion back online over email and through uh, the collaborative platforms. We do have other webinars coming up in this series. Environmental law will be next, followed by engagement. We are planning another round of gender-focused webinars in September. And we will be making these presentations available. Of course, we'll be working with all of the speakers to make sure that they approve and, and give us final versions of their presentations to make available. Moreover, we'll be following up with each of you speakers to make available some of the specific resources that you mentioned, training tools, methodologies, even workshop guides that we know, having, having seen some of these, will be very applicable and useful to other uh, partners across the SRJS uh, program. So I'll bring us to a close. Again, apologies for going so terribly over, over time and profound thanks to all of you. And we look forward to staying in touch. Please do reach out to us. We'll make uh, contact information available again. And we wish you a wonderful day. Thank you.